has started today. Um, members of the board, today is um, a kind of significant for a couple of reasons. One is it's our first chance in almost two years to welcome people back in person. So it's great to have some faces beside me at the table and um, great to also have folks joining us online. So as you can tell, this is um, a little bit of an experiment, our first trial run of a hybrid meeting format. So thank you for our patience with technology. We're gonna be doing our best throughout this meeting to make sure that everyone in the room as well as everyone who's joining us online has a great experience and can be able to see and hear everything that they need to today. So please um, chat with us or reach out to staff if you're having any difficulties and we certainly welcome feedback after this meeting on how we could uh, improve this experience. Okay, so the other thing board members is we have a kind of unusual schedule, perfect storm of schedule uncertainties today, given that it is the last week of legislative session and numerous other things going on. So we are, um, uh, according to our rules, we can uh, have a presiding officer preside over a meeting and um, board member Nelson has graciously agreed to step in as the presiding officer for this day only. Um, so welcome, Paul, and thank you for stepping into that role. So we will take the, the procedural step in just a minute of, of, of nominating him and electing him in as presiding officer. But before we do that, I want to start with a round of introductions and say hi to the folks who are joining us in the room and online. So we're going to do a go around. We'll start in the room. Um, board members who are in the room, please just introduce yourself, say who you are and what your role is. And I also do want to say that we're welcoming three new board members today, one who is with us here, Riley Hintz, and then joining us online are Joseph Bauer-Kemper and Peter Bakken. And so big welcome to our new members. Um, when it comes to you three for introductions, I'm hoping you could just take a couple minutes to give us a little bit of intro of who you are and, and what your background is. Um, and then from there, we will move into our procedural steps. So I will turn it over to Julie to introduce yourself first. Hey, hi, nice to see everybody. I'm Julie Gehring, and I'm a public member from Congressional District 7. Good afternoon. I am Louise Miltich. I am sitting in as a proxy for my commissioner, Grace Arnold. Uh, Riley Hintz, a uh, public board member, new public board member for District 2. Uh, I, my background's in public policy. Full time, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit, the Lake Puppet Legacy Alliance, and uh, previously served a term on the Clean Water Council. So, that's a bit of my background. Uh, Paul Nelson, I'm a public member representing the Rational District 6. Excellent. And now I'll cue the folks who are joining us online. So, first up, we have um, Commissioner. Roberts-Davis, if you could go on, unmute and introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, it's Commissioner Alice Roberts-Davis from the Department of Administration. Thank you. Um, and next, uh, board member Joseph Bauer-Kemper. Hi, greetings friends. I'm Joseph Bauer-Kemper. Uh, as Katie mentioned, a new board member coming from the 8th District. I serve on the faculty in the Department of American Indian Studies at the Duluth campus of the University of Minnesota, and also as affiliate faculty teaching a class at the Humphrey School there in the Twin Cities. Uh, and I also happen to be involved in facilitating the state of Minnesota's tribal state relations training program, and I'm excited to be a, a new member part of this group. Thanks. Great. Welcome. Welcome, Joseph. And next we have Kevin McKinnon standing in for Commissioner Grove. Kevin, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, good afternoon, Kevin McKinnon. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Economic Development and Research uh, at uh, DEED, the Department of Employment and Economic Development, uh, sitting in for my commissioner, as you mentioned, uh, Steve Grove. Thank you for being here. And next we'll turn it over to Dan Hopp, who is sitting in for um, Commissioner Malcolm. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dan Hoff. I'm an assistant commissioner with the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, I'm representing Commissioner Malcolm today. And unfortunately, I will have to leave early today for some other pressing. Thank you. Great. Thank you for being here. And um, again, I think we will have some some folks who have to leave early. It's a complicated day with legislative affairs going on. Um, next, I'll turn it over to board member Conar Steenberg. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Conner, Steenberg, public member for Congressional District 5. Great. 
And then um, Commissioner uh, Davenberger. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about my audio issues. Hopefully you can hear me. This is Nancy. Nancy Doppenberger. I'm the interim commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. I also need to leave and our deputy commissioner Kim Collins will be jumping on when I uh, need to leave today and welcome new members. Thank you. And next we have uh, board member Martin. Hey everyone. Up. We can we can hear you Nick. We're just getting a little echo. Sorry about that. Hi everyone, uh, Nicholas Martin, a uh, uh, public member for Congressional District 4. Excellent, hello. And then next, um, board member Peter Bakken, if you would uh, share a, a little bit about yourself as well. Uh, thanks for the welcome, uh, Peter Bakken. I am in the southwest corner of the state, I believe Cong Congressional District 1. Um, I am a farmer. Uh, when we met last week, I was planting corn and this week I'm still planting corn. So trying to get that finished up, looking forward to my first meeting. And I'm a, a beef farmer and uh, row crops. Excellent. Welcome. And next we have um, Sue Vento sitting in for Met Council. Hi, I'm Sue Vento. I'm um, Met Council Chair Charlie Zelli's designee. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. Uh, I think that's everyone I see. Am I missing anyone? Looking at my staff team too. Okay, great. Um, and I do know that Commissioner Stroman is expecting to be here. She's running just a little bit late from her last meeting. We'll have other folks uh, jumping on. Great, so just for the record, we do have quorum. And again, I want to just uh, walk us through our procedural step of um, of, of electing a presiding officer for today. So the way this is work, I just need a nomination from the floor, someone to second that, and then we'll take a voice vote with those of you virtual, please unmuting yourself. So do I have a nomination for Paul Nelson for presiding officer? I nominate Paul Nelson. Thank you, Julie. And a second? Riley will second. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to board member Nelson. Uh, well, thanks for, for putting up with me on the last minute notice. Um, and uh, first item on the agenda then is the approval of the consent agenda. There are two items on that, and these are items that are deemed non controversial to be passed on one voice motion. The two items are the meeting minutes from February 16 and the preliminary agenda for today, May 18th, 2022. And for, for new members, I did look up whether you could vote on meeting minutes where you weren't in attendance. And yes, you can. There's nothing that prohibits people from voting on things they know nothing about. So, so, <laughs> uh, so with, with that, um, if you are joining uh, virtually, please unmute for this portion of it. And is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Goring is a second. I can make the second. I'm giving other people that opportunity. <laughs> okay. Second by Heinz. Um, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, um, we'll take a Voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Hearing no opposition, the motion carries and consent agenda is adopted. Now I'll turn it back to Executive Director Pratt for the Executive Director's report. Great. Thank you, Board Member Nelson. And before I get into my Executive Director's report, I um, actually want to acknowledge that we have a special guest with us today which is our, our former board member, Al Forsberg, who is joining us today. We wanted to take a minute to, to be able to acknowledge that he has um, turned off the board and acknowledge his service to the board and give him a few minutes to reflect. We've asked other outgoing members to just take a few minutes to reflect on their time with the UP. And so I gave him two prompts, which he may choose to respond to or, or say something else entirely um, different. But one is what was one highlight of your time 
serving as a board member and what is one hope that you have for the future of UPD. So Al, I'll have you come up and jump into this spot so that you can be on camera. Well, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, my four years on the board has been an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to serve. It's been a real learning experience for me. Uh, my uh, criteria on whether a meeting was worth it or not was, did you learn something or did you make a difference? And I think in almost all meetings, that was the case. Uh, I tried to bring what I think was a unique perspective to the board uh, from greater Minnesota, first of all. And we often don't participate because it's not handy for us, but we need to, it's very important. As a person who is actually, as a county engineer, done in the EAW, done in the EIS, and then almost all road and bridge projects are near water, or touch water, and so draw on numerous permits from the DNR and the PCA and Bowser and the Corps of Engineers uh, for even a simple, straightforward road safety project. And then construct, done on and constructed projects on budget and on schedule and with public support. Not 100% always, but good, with good public support, or I wouldn't have been reappointed, I guess. Uh, the highlights, well, I, I wasn't able to confine myself to one. I apologize for that. <laughs> the highlights in my mind were the uh, meeting in Red Wing, when we had a good turnout of people. And it was surprising in that uh, some felt that we didn't need any more study, we needed to take the action. And others felt we already have enough rules and regulations. There wasn't much support for doing a full generic EIS, at least as I read the, the crew that night. And then a strategic planning session we had uh, where there was considerable vision shown by all the agencies that were there and the people that were there. That was great. And then the uh, original EQB uh, folks who developed the legislation and carried it through to establish an authorized EQB, made presentations to the board at one meeting. And uh, it was really interesting to see what their goals were when the EQB was established and how much authority we have under the legislature to do more than we're currently doing. Uh, okay, so as far as future hopes for the EQB, I would hope that we, that we well, I guess it still is my board. It's just as a citizen rather than as a board member. I would hope that we are an action board as well as a reaction board. We need to take input from the public, but we also need to take action. When John Link Stein from the PCA left, he said, if you want to accomplish something, you got to have resolutions and vote. <laughs> and I think that's a good measure, actually. I think we need to work on the broader public view and then follow up on those views the public brings us. And when we, every time we've, we've taken some action here, I thought, okay, my little rural residential neighborhood south of Mankato, we've got a retired electrical engineer, a lawn services and a health clerical person, uh, a heavy equipment operator, and then one household with a parole officer and a guard at the uh, St. Peter Security Hospital. I thought, okay, how would these folks react to it? They're the workers out there that we're not reaching as well as I think we should. And then always, when we look at revising our rules, we're adding time, perhaps. We're adding cost to the project proposers. Is there a corresponding benefit? If there isn't, you know, why are you doing it? We're a public agency. We should be working for the public health, safety, and welfare. So with that, uh, I'm disappointed to be leaving, but I'm very pleased to see uh, Peter coming on board as a working farmer out in Western Minnesota. I want to thank uh, my fellow board members, both the public and the commissioners. I want to thank the EQB staff, who I know work very hard, and they're very patient working with people who have pretty pressing questions at times. And I want to thank the public that have brought issues to us. That's good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al, and thank you for sharing those words of wisdom, and really an honor to have you work with you on this board, and thank you so much for your service, and to the other public members who have turned off recently, Brian Murdoch, Kristen I. Tolson. So those of you who are in the, joining us virtually, Kristen is in the room today as well as a public participant, which is, which is wonderful. And Benny Waki, um, you all just bring so much to the board. And as I've said before, the doors are always welcome. Just because you've turned off doesn't mean this isn't still in your board, as you say now. So um, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
Great. Okay, so I am just going to uh, use the rest of my time to just walk you through the agenda and the logistics for today. Um, today, there are four agenda items. First, we'll be hearing a brief update from Denise Wilson on the subcommittee for pilot um, program implementation. And then we'll also be hearing a brief update from um, the staff member Faith Krogstead on the Emerging Environmental Leaders Program. Following that, staff member Eric Dahl will give you an overview of the energy and environment report card and discuss possible next steps on this project. And then following that, we'll have an update from the interagency pollinator protection team about their about the um, action framework as well as an upcoming pollinator event in June. So you'll get to hear from our very wonderful EQB staff team today with a lot of great work that they've been doing. Um, before the meeting, at the, at the end of the meeting, we'll have a public comment period if members of the public want to share anything um, that they've heard today on the agenda. Then also, after we adjourn the meeting, you are all welcome, members of the public, staff, board members, to join us up in the cafeteria one floor up. We have some snacks and time to just socialize and, and celebrate the return to in-person meeting. So by all means, join us. And I apologize for those who are joining virtually that we can't send snacks your way, but uh, Maybe you can run down from your office wherever that might be. Okay, great. In terms of uh, in terms of our hybrid meeting logistics, so as I've already mentioned, um, you know we hope to make this a smooth uh, process for everyone and have a good experience for everyone. Um, I noted that the microphones are, are pretty sensitive, so just be aware of background noises. Um, let's see, uh, board members, there's an opportunity to ask questions and have discussion after each of the presentations today from staff. So go ahead and just jump in. We'll try our best um, to kind of mix the conversation between members who are in the room and joining us online. So those of you online, please use the raise hand teach, uh, feature if you, uh, if you want to jump into the discussion or just unmute yourself and jump in. We'll be able to hear you. Um, again, try and making this feel, feel as much like we're all in the same room together as possible. Um, please do. If you can turn your camera on when when we have those discussion periods that's helpful so we can get to know one another okay so members of the public as i mentioned there's an opportunity for public comment today if members of the public are in the room and would like to make public comment we have a, a sign up at the sign up table so if you haven't done so already please just jot your name down so we have it recorded there um, members of the public who are joining us online uh, similar to how we've been doing it in our in our remote meetings, um, you'll use the raise hand feature. Let's see if my staff can just queue up that slide. There we go. So um, use the raise hand feature. Next slide, please. And you can just see it at the bottom of your screen on WebEx, or if you're joining by phone, you have to click the three dots. So um, feel free to raise your hand at any point in the meeting, and, and we'll be watching for, for those once we get to the public comment period. And then finally, just feel free to reach out to EQB staff at any point. There's some um, contact information in the packet if you have any questions or technical difficulties during the meeting. And with that, I will turn it back to um, Board Member Nassen. Thank you, Dirk, Director Pratt. Uh, now I'll introduce the next agenda item. This is an update from the subcommittee for the pilot program implementation. And it, my understanding is purely informational update. And I'll turn it over to Denise Wilson for that update. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and um, members of the board. Uh, for members of the public, my name is Denise Wilson, and I am the director of the Environmental Review Program for um, EQB. And this afternoon, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of an update about a program that is ongoing through September, the pilot program um, for, in, for um, integrating in climate into the environmental review program. So next slide, please. So um, as far as recruitment, um, these, these are the participants that we have registered to participate. The value of the registration is that um, these are folks that are committed to practicing and using the new revised EAW form on a voluntary basis. And then also these are members of um, the cohort. So we have um, a process that I'll talk about in just a minute for um, you know, reaching out to people who are practicing the form and offering them some additional support as they go through the process. 
So right now we have 97 total registered participants from around the state. 26 um, are local registered or responsible governmental units. Those are our governmental units that are tasked with implementing the environmental review program and pre preparing environmental documents. All um, seven state responsible governmental units are registered and we have participation from 30 unique consulting firms. And so there's, there's often multiple participants from each of these organizations, which is why we have 97 participants. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, as part of the pilot program, um, we've had a monthly speaker and cohort session. So um, we start out with, um, for the first hour, we have a speaker and that session is open to the public. And it's um, on topics that we think will be helpful to people who are implementing the EAW form. And um, then uh, we close that session and we um, send out invitations to cohort members so that we create a sort of a, a safe space for discussion um, among people who are practicing. So they have time to sort of um, think through ideas they might have for, for answering or responding to some of the questions or um, raise issues or concerns where, um, you know, and, and get some help sort of resolving those concerns. And we also ask the speakers, you know, for the first portion of the cohort session to be available to answer the more technical detailed questions. And so in February, just as a recap, February, we had a discussion on greenhouse gas assessment. We had Bar Engineering come and give us an example project. And they used the guidance that we created to support implementation of the EAW form. And they just walked through a practice um, project and, and how the guidance could apply to that evaluation. In March, we had the Minnesota Department of Transportation give an overview of their um, greenhouse gas calculator for the, and it's called the Minnesota Infrastructure Carbon Estimator Greenhouse Gas Calculator. And it's specifically, it's Minnesota MICE. And um, it's specifically for transportation projects. But what we learned from that um, session is that it, it actually can apply to sort of transportation sources beyond just transportation projects. And so um, they're making that tool available to all local units of government and other Know, state state agencies to to actually use that GHG quantifier too, and then in April we had the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy present um, on how communities use and understand environmental review information. So as a consumer of the information, they gave us their perspective on on what they felt um, what was usable information and for these responsible governmental units to think about in how they frame their responses to the EAW form. Um, so next slide, please. So coming up, we have in May, the um, Climate Tools for Adaptation and Planning in Minnesota. And so Louise Miltich from the Department of Commerce will um, talk through a, a recent project that they did and included the climate information in that environmental assessment. And then Dr. Kenneth Blumenfeld, from a senior climatologist from the Department of Natural Resource, will sort of show some climate tools that will be helpful as um, we talk through the lessons learned from uh, the Department of Commerce and the evaluation that they prepared. And so we, we hope that's an opportunity to sort of identify where there are um, really effective tools and maybe some gaps in information and, and how to sort of uh, kind of relate the data to the information and providing that information in a meaningful and useful way. So we're excited about that session and that's Monday, May 23rd. Again, the speaker session open to the public. Anyone can join, the link is on our website. And then um, for the cohort meeting, that'll begin at 2 p.m. So then on Thursday, June 23rd, we'll have um, a panel of experienced legal practitioners. We have three attorneys that are going to offer sort of their perspective on considerations for developing an effective administrative record. This is, we've received feedback from, especially some of the local units of government, often it's challenging to understand what information is necessary and how much information to include in the environmental assessment. And, um, 
and, and often the, that, the answer to that question is what information is necessary for that administrative um, record. And so we'll have a previous EQB attorney um, giving us an historic perspective of past legal um, cases. Then we'll have someone from the attorney general's office talk about more recent um, cases that have been challenged based on climate information. And we'll have a state RGU attorney talk about um, things that she considers in helping their staff prepare these administrative records or, or making effective decisions. So next slide, please. So here are the projects that are available for review right now that are part of the pilot program. We've had seven EAWs using the, the the draft revised PAW form. Um, if you would like to go and review these projects, they we have um, on our website, you can go to the EQB monitor. Um, it's a drop down box under the environmental review tab. And you can look um, for the link to the archives. And then you can click on the dates of publication. And then you'll be able to evaluate or to um, review those EAWs. Some may or may not be still available for public comment, but we are tracking how many projects go through and, and who uses those forms. Um, next slide, please. Oh, um, before we go on to, can we just go back? One, one more thing to add is when you're looking through the EQB monitor, the projects that use the draft revised EAW form are noted with a star next to the project title. So next slide, please. So after you go through and review the EAW form, and you, if you don't feel compelled to, to submit comments, those, those um, comments should be directed on those projects to that responsible governmental unit. However, if you review the information and you'd like to offer us some feedback on your experience, what you thought of the information, you can go to the, um, the, the Climate Change and Environmental Review webpage, and there's a link for you to take a survey to provide feedback on your experience um, for, uh, just from reviewing those projects. Next slide, please. In addition to that sort of general opportunity um, to take the survey, we are looking for targeted feedback opportunities too. So once we receive a record of decision that, that is required to be published in the EQB monitor, we are emailing surveys to the responsible governmental unit, the project proposer, and the technical consultant if they're identified and asking them to provide feedback from their experience in addition, we're sending um, a survey to the, the responsible government unit and asking them to forward that survey to anyone that commented on the EAW. So we get a, a perspective of, of someone who reviewed the information but may not have submitted it, but we also have a very targeted um, ask for people who went through the process and did submit a comment. And so, um, that way we feel like we'll have a robust set of information to make a determination and an observation on um, you know how what their experience was in using the draft revised form next slide please so other ways to stay informed about the pilot program are to visit the eqb webpage that i just mentioned for environmental review and climate on there you'll also find the opportunity to sign up for email updates through gov delivery um, just for general updates and also um, all of our notices in addition to being sent out through gov delivery are posted in the EQB monitor so those um, updates would include you know the next the time and topic for the speaker session the cohort session and then um, upcoming um, board meetings and subcommittee meetings and also I will mention too that all of the um, speaker sessions were recorded and those are also available on the website. So if you want to go back and listen to past speaker sessions, you can do that as well. Um, next slide, please. So the next steps in June, as I mentioned, we have um, the speaker session and the cohort meeting as well as July. In August, we're hoping to, to reconvene the subcommittee for pilot program implementation and talk through the framework for reporting feedback. So we'll be getting a lot of responses from the questions the, the SPPI members help develop. And so they're going to be, um, you know, we'll, we'll be getting this feedback and it'll be helpful to understand, you know, what, what's the best framework for providing 
that information back to the, the Environmental Review Implementation Subcommittee and subsequent board for their decision making. And then, um, so after we have the framework in September, the pilot program ends at the end of September, we'll be compiling that information using that framework, and then we'll be presenting that in October to the Environmental um, Review Implementation Subcommittee, asking them to consider the feedback and also identify if changes should be made to the AW form ahead of presenting it to the board in December for a final decision on that form. And we'll also be taking some uh, feedback on the guidance document too, so we'll, we'll better understand how improvements could be made to that guidance as well. That's the next. Next slide. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email address and, and phone number. So. Thank you, Denise. Um, before we move on to questions from, from the board, I'd like to recognize that Commissioner Stroman, Commissioner Kessler, and Vice Chair Jerry Van Amberg have joined us. And with that, we'll take questions. Those uh, board members in, in the room, you can just raise your hand. Those online, you can virtually raise your hand, and staff will be watching for that. So, if there are any questions for Denise, I have a question, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Wilson. I am wondering if you could go back to the map that shows kind of the distribution of participants in the pilot program and just walk us through what the different colors on that map mean. It might just be a visual thing in this room, but I'm just curious if you could walk through kind of what that color coding means. Okay, so, um, Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Board Member Miltich. So um, here we have the, the yellow are local responsible governmental units. That's where someone from a, a, a local city, township, uh, you know, watershed district, anyone who by rule could act from a local perspective as a responsible governmental unit. As I mentioned before, all seven state agencies that, that perform that role are registered also. Then um, the purple are the, um, sorry, I'm not seeing the, the key. Consultants. Oh, the yeah. technical consultants. And so that's where we have um, consultants from those counties who are registered. And then the stripe is where we have both, where we actually have people from that are technical consultants and local responsible governmental units. And the goal was to get as, as broad a perspective from people implementing this form as possible from around the state. And I think this is an indicator that um, should they have an EIW um, during the pilot program, not all members of the, the um, pilot program would necessarily have an EIW, but should they have them, um, they would um, have the opportunity, they would represent that perspective, but they are also participating in the cohort. So as we sort of go through lessons learned and understanding, they also have the opportunity to contribute to that discussion. Other questions from the board? And one, uh, Nicholas Martin. Thanks, Chair. Um, Director Wilson, I'm just curious, you mentioned there's seven projects participating and then a larger number of RGUs and uh, consultants. Do you have a sense how many of those RGUs and or consultants are currently working on one of those seven projects versus those that are just sort of doing it for their own learning because they anticipate, you know, projects in the future? So the ones, um, anyone who is registered for the pilot program has um, agreed to, to use the form. So it's possible that we have those registered um, participants that just are not actively working on a process. Our project, I, I don't have a sense. We we have during the cohort meetings, we have had a discussion and asked for people to volunteer and let us know if they have a project underway. You know, this early, it's likely that the EAWs that were being noticed were just starting to see the first flush because um, there were projects already underway. It's hard to go back and, and use a different form at that point. So we hope to sort of um, pick up some momentum and, and see um, the form used more frequently, but we don't have a sense of um, sort of what's queued up or what's pending. Any 
other questions from the board? Otherwise, I, I do have one myself. I'll wait and see if you wait. Um, my under, so far, you've been successful at scheduling all the speaker series when I've had other obligations, but, it, but it, and is continuing. Um, but my understanding is you have recorded those and have those online for those of us who have missed or for new members who want to go back and, and view some of those. Correct. That's correct, Mr. Chair. No, they're on the. Um, if you go to our website under the Environmental Review tab, there's um, some drop-down tabs, and you go to Climate and Environmental Review. Um, you can go and just um, open those up and, and see the recording. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move on the agenda. With that, then a next item is a presentation by Faith Crownstead. Uh, regarding the Emerging Environmental Leaders Program. And again, I think this is largely informational, but we'll have some discussion. All right, thank you, Presiding Officer Nelson, members of the board, and members of the public. My name is Faith Krogstad. I'm the Engagement and Communications Director at the Environmental Quality Board. And I'm here to give an update on the Emerging Environmental Leaders Program, which is affectionately called the EELS Program, which is our initiative for um, engagement with young people. Next slide. Today I'll talk about the recent history of youth engagement at EQB, what we've learned from that experience, and then also uh, what we are planning moving forward. Next slide. So public engagement is a core work area at the Environmental Quality Board. It's an important aspect of creating good policy um, and practice. And I just wanted to highlight one goal in our strategic plan, which is that Minnesotans are engaged in policy dialogue and diverse perspectives are considered in EQB policy development. And the youth audience is especially important because, um, well, not least because the, the decisions that we're making today that will affect environmental quality, uh, they will be most impacted by those in the future. Next slide, please. Hey, I'm gonna jump in and just see if you can uh, speak just a tad louder. We have the blowers going on in the, sure. in the background, which is creating some background noise. So, all right, no problem. Um, so I just wanted to share some characteristics of uh, our engagement with young people at EQB in recent years. We have used a cohort model, so we've recruited uh, young people from across the state into a group and, and kind of carried that group forward. Um, we have partnered with several external organizations, most notably the University of Minnesota, but also with Climate Generation and the Science Museum of Minnesota. And that has been a, a really nice way of bringing a lot of different skills together and sharing, sharing the work of this. Um, the young people have been a variety of ages between, I would say, 13 to 24, and at various uh, stages of their, their lives, so maybe in, they're in middle school or high school, they're in higher education, they're taking a gap year, or um, they're in early career. Uh, by and large, they have participated um, as volunteers, but last year we were able to offer them a small honorarium, um, which I think was meaningful to them, although I wish we could have given them more. Um, and then the work of the group has largely been very much project-based, so centered on planning and leading a meeting, uh, a public meeting, and uh, maybe doing some activities that, that relate to that as well. And uh, over here, we have some photos of um, some of the, the previous youth engagement work. Uh, we have a photo of a keynote speech at our Environmental Congress, um, a youth voice board meeting, the EQB, um, and then last year we had a, a fully booked virtual um, a youth led meeting as well. Next slide, please. So, just a quick recent history of youth engagement. Uh, 2013, the cohort organized the Next Generation Youth Environmental Congress, and they catalyzed Youth Voice in advance of the wider Environmental Congress that EQB hosted. In 2018, uh, the cohort hosted a youth voice board meeting, the EQB, and the board passed a resolution to dedicate one board meeting per year to youth perspectives. In 2019, they contributed to the Environmental Congress event in Mankato, 
uh, where they organized the, the keynote and delivered the keynote speech, hosted a breakout session, and organized a student postcard campaign where they uh, designed the, the postcards and um, got them out to thousands of students across the state to collect ideas on climate action from young people. We uh, had a delay in, in 2020 due to the pandemic, uh, but we were back at it in 2021, where the cohort led the Young Leaders Talk Climate Joint Meeting of the EQB and the Climate Change Sub-Cabinet. Um, at that meeting, the, the young people shared their stories, their climate stories, how climate is affecting them in their realities and, and um, how they viewed their futures. And then they also um, wanted to have a discussion with the board about ways that the board could and the subcabinet could uh, deepen their youth engagement efforts. Next slide, please. So what have we learned through, through this? Many things. Uh, we, there are many benefits to engaging with youth. They exhibit powerful leadership. Um, they're doing really amazing, great work around the state. They bring us fresh perspectives and ideas to our work. Um, we learn a lot working with, with young people and how to communicate and engage with them. Um, they connect us to new audiences in ways that would be difficult for us to do. Um, and then, you know, we hope that they also benefit from the experience as well, the skill development and leadership experiences. Uh, we've also had a, a number of challenges. Youth work is, uh, youth development work is really challenging. Um, we have a small staff at the EQB, and, you know, if we want to give the kind of time and attention to the um, engagement of young people, it, it is a challenge because our work at the EQB is, is dynamic and things can come at us unexpectedly and we're, we're pulled in a lot of directions. Um, and then just logistically, it, you know, there are a number of challenges as far as you know, just getting stipends or honoraria out the door to them. Um, working with minors, you know, do we have all the right policies in place and partnerships in order to make that work? Um, and then as far as scheduling uh, meetings, et cetera, was, that was hard too. Um, Another learning curve that was voiced actually in the 2021 meeting was just that state government is really hard to figure out. So there's a big learning curve uh, there. And how do you how do you understand how state government works and how do you um, have influence within that space? And the cohort model kind of limited the amount of time that we had to really dig into that. Um, and just lastly, that that agency and influence, the how much um, influence could they really have in that amount? So next slide, please. So we, we got a lot of feedback from the participants in our um, field program. And one big thing I wanted to highlight that came through loud and clear was that they really want to see the EQB um, have a more formal, systematic, and sustained way of working with youth. Um, and so that's something that we've really been thinking about a lot. And uh, I, you know, the, the EELS generated ideas at board meeting, um, the joint meeting back in March of last year, and um, there was a, a good brainstorm at the time. Um, go to the next slide. We had, um, I've been working with the Minnesota Youth Council. They approached us serendipitously to say they really were wondering if, if um, they could have uh, create some connections between the EQB and the Minnesota Youth Council. Um, so actually one of the, the youth members approached us. Uh, so just a little bit about the Minnesota Youth Council. It's a collaborative of youth leaders who are amplifying youth voice and agency within the state of Minnesota. There are 36 members, four per congressional district, four at-large members. They're in grades 8 through 12. They act as a voice for youth to the Minnesota legislature and the governor. They're actually the only legislatively mandated youth advisory council um, in the country that advises the, the legislature. So their, their work really encompasses um, providing feedback to legislative initiatives that relate to youth. They also put forward their own initiatives. And then they also partner with organizations um, to represent youth voice and uh, carry out some hands-on projects. Next slide, please. So I have been meeting with this group, they have an environmental committee and they're looking for um, an organization to <coughs> partner with. And we, we've talked about some ideas for working together um, that we would bring to the board for your consideration. 
And one is really related to policy, similar to what they do at the legislature. Um, when EQB has policy work, they could be providing feedback, they could be participating in uh, those discussions, um, bringing new issues forward, et cetera. They could have a more formal uh, role at the board, uh, maybe a liaison role where somebody would be would have a few minutes on the agenda at each meeting to share what they're talking about at the Minnesota Youth Council. Um, and then they could also bring back what they're hearing from the Environmental Quality Board to the Youth Council to inform their work there. Um, and then lastly, engagement, uh, working on more of those kind of hands-on projects to raise awareness about environmental issues among youth and increase youth voice in those issues. Um, and one of, in, in the meeting, there was one member who got really excited about environmental review. And, you know, I really, he really wanted um, people to understand what environmental review was and, and uh, the process and how people can get involved. Um, and, and so how do you share that with um, young audiences? So the next step is to, as I mentioned, um, bring forward a proposal to the board. I'm on their schedule, so I don't have a timeline for you. Um, but you know, the hope is that we could um, bring something forward for your consideration uh, within this year. Certainly. Thank you, Faith. Um, I'll open it up to questions from the board. Uh, again, those in the room, just raise your hand. Online, virtually, raise your hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Faith. Thank you for um, the recap of how um, our youth engagement has worked and um, for your work with the Minnesota Youth Council to sort of envision how um, we can use an existing structure and group and um, get the benefit. And I don't really have any questions. Um, I think, you know, your the direction that you're exploring with them seems um, like of great benefit to both um, EQB and um, the Minnesota Youth Council. I just continue to believe um, as I've engaged with the youth uh, in our youth development programs at DNR and um, some of the work that we're doing to try to expand youth voices and the work that we're doing, um, it is so important. And um, I find it some of the most inspiring work that we do because they ask different kinds of questions than we typically hear from other constituents that attend our meetings. And they provide um, perspectives that are a little bit different. They're super constructive. Um, they're super hopeful, <laughs> and and they want to engage. And um, so I am really excited about that. And I would also just say, you know, I, I don't want to make this bigger than it is, but if there is an opportunity to right to tie um, those conversations not only from EQB but to the member agencies of EQB and some of the work we're doing, that might be something else. You know, we would be interested in exploring. Other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I'm just curious, is there a cohort within the youth council that's specifically interested in environmental issues or like what's, yeah, that's the question. <laughs> yes, thank you for that question, board member Hintz. Um, there is an environmental committee of the Minnesota Youth Council, so they, they identify their issue areas that they're interested in. So I believe there are four different issue areas and, and environmental justice is one of them. We have a question online. Yes. Uh, Sue Bento. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not there might be a possibility at some point to compile a, a list of, of organizations that have a youth emphasis related to climate and the environment. Um, I serve on a nonprofit board that um, in the last few years has initiated a, a youth focus and really is going gangbusters. And I think there might be a great opportunity to create a kind of a collaborative network and, and help bring those groups together. Um, I think the question around the logistics uh, from a, um, a K-12 issue as a former educator, th there are lots of issues there that we need to really think through, um, whether we formally get involved or, or informally get involved. The other thing that I really, really appreciated was the EEL conversation with the board last year, and I hope we keep that, that post-secondary emphasis. Um, 
one of the eels from last year's meeting uh, lives in my Met Council district, and we've met for coffee a couple of times, and he's continues to be quite an activist. And this program is just having, um, I think, a deep impact on a lot of young people. And it it makes me feel better having just celebrated a, a birthday <laughs> and being reminded that I'm getting older. So um, thank you for doing this program. And um, if if you're ever looking for um, people who want to be a part of a conversation to help further this, I'd be happy to, to do that, um, uh, both as a Met Council member, but also as a former educator and as someone who's involved in an environmental nonprofit. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Vento. I, I do have a, a question or a comment too. I, I echo Commissioner Stroman's words about uh, this being important and uh, mentoring involved. And I wonder a little bit as you move forward with with the proposal or plan, is this largely um, kind of event related, uh, staff related? Do you? Is there room for board members, say such as myself, who largely a volunteer to 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 offer themselves to to meet with the groups on on things, um, or is it coming to the board meetings, participating in board meetings, or separate, or wide open, all of the above? With any, you get your crystal ball out, I guess. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, thank you for that question, Presiding Officer Nelson. Um, the the group has. Just, you know, they, they shared some previous experiences that they had had partnering with other organizations. And I think, um, you know, it's important to them that, that they are crafting something that will really serve their needs. Um, and so I want to be very careful about, um, you know, how that, that whatever we create, you know, we are honoring their, um, their work and also figuring out you know, what will also serve the EQB's needs. And so that will be a little bit of a dance. And I don't know that I can predict um, what they'll want to do. Um, I think it will depend on the specific members of the group and who really wants to lean in um, to this. And, and you know, it will be driven by their interests. I might just chime in on one point. One thing that um, you know, Faith didn't mention um, in the presentation is that in some of these past years we've had had an opportunity for um, for small group meetings between board members and some of the cohort members or one-on-one -on -one or small group meetings and and the the, um, the youth involved in the cohorts have overwhelmingly loved that opportunity loved that experience and um, so you know while it can be a scheduling challenge I don't see any reason why we couldn't have at least that level of involvement it seemed like a really positive thing and and for our board members as well to kind of get to know a few individuals and have those conversations with them. So I think, yeah, there's there's opportunity. And if I may add to that, I just rewatched the meeting from um, last year in May, and it was, it was one year ago, actually, now that I think about it. Um, and one of the, the two ideas that that group put forward to the board was uh, the idea of youth mentors, that um, board members uh, might want to consider having a youth mentor to to talk to and, and get some um, you know ideas from and bounce bounce ideas off of and and whatnot. So um, I think there would be we certainly have a, a pool of a few alumni uh, that would be interested in that um, if the Minnesota Youth Council members would you know decide to go in a different direction. Unless there are any other questions. We'll move on to the next agenda item. I see it. I can just okay. one more. Yeah. Looks like Gerald Van Amber. Yep. Mr. Chair and uh, Faith, <clears throat> the uh, you know the youth group, the youth council, and and also Eels, I think brings a tremendously important perspective to uh, uh, to looking at. Uh, Many of the problems uh, that we face in Minnesota, but one of the questions I have is how, what is the geographic representation uh, on the uh, council as well as eels? I guess I, I understand, you know, I can understand it's probably difficult maybe to recruit uh, across, but I think it's important to try and get a balanced, uh, a balanced representation too. Uh, 
for that matter. And, and do we have that? Well, thank you for that question, um, Board Member Van Inberg. The Minnesota Youth Council has four members per congressional district plus four at-large members. As far as who is on the environmental committee, I'm not sure uh, what their geographic representation is. Um, but you know that is a benefit of a potential benefit of working with the, the council is that they do have that geographic diversity. And even if we just work with a few members from the environmental justice committee, um, we would have that connection to the full council. Um, when we have recruited members for the EELS program in the past, we used to have it in person. And so that was limited to um, more local participants. Um, and last year, we, we really were able, because it was fully virtual, we did um, recruit from across the state. Um, but we did find that it was more difficult for us to recruit, um, you know, to, to get a pool of applicants that really represented the geographic diversity plus other, um, you know, making sure we had a diversity of other demographics. And how are they? How are they recruited for the youth council? Uh, you say there's in every congressional district. Um, do they have to apply, or is this? Uh, how do they go about getting people on the council? Youth. I know that they have to apply, and I believe they are appointed, but I'm not. I'm not sure about that actually. So I'll I'll retract that. I know that they have to apply. Um, but I, I can find out more. The, the organization that runs that program, uh, the, the, the council, is the Alliance with Youth. So I could certainly find out more from them how members are selected. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Craig. Board member, before we go on, just um, a quick uh, logistics note for our board members is we're getting a request that if you can please just introduce yourself again when you speak, um, both for people online and in person. It just helps people follow along and, and learn who's who. So we'll all do our best to remember to introduce ourselves. Thank you. Next on the agenda is an update from Eric Ball on the energy and report card. And again, a lot of this is informational, but Eric, I understand you are looking for some specific feedback from us. Yes, thank you uh, for the provide, presiding officer Nelson, excuse me. I'm Eric uh, Cedar Leap Dahl, and I'm here to give an update on the Environment and Energy Report Card as well as some background on it. So I'll move through quite a bit here. And uh, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the outline for today. I'll go through the purpose and background of the Environment and Energy Report Card, and then I'll talk about some lessons learned and challenges around the Environment and Energy Report Card as well as the 2023. In the shorthand, we use the E and E Report Card options there and then I really would love to hear ideas and have a discussion with the board and see if you have any questions and then talk about next steps. So, next slide please. So the Environment and Energy, Energy Report Card started in uh, 2011 with an executive order from Governor Dayton that was a, directed for the board to uh, prepare an Environment and Energy Report Card that identifies metrics which the state of Minnesota can use to measure its performance and progress protecting valuable air, water, and land resources. And with help of staff from several state agencies, the Environment and Energy Report Card was prepared, prepared to provide a snapshot of Minnesota's environment, um, you know, providing valuable information to the public and policymakers. And the report focuses on five key areas of Minnesota's environment, climate, energy, air, water, and land. The E and E report is a cross agency and cross media, meaning each of those sections that is unique and useful as a high level look at how we're doing as a whole on the environment and energy issues. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I mentioned, it started in 2011, and in 2012, we put together the first iteration of the environment and energy report card. You can see that here on my screen. It's on the left, the white version. Um, with five sections, air, energy, climate, land, and water. Uh, the sections were developed by the board in 2012 via numerous outreach activities and board uh, discussions. The report card was also completed in 2017 and 2019. You can see those here on the screen and they're available at the desk over there and I included the 2019 version of the packet. 
In 2016, in preparation for the 2017 E&E report card, EQB and interagency staff compiled all available data sources and hosted an interagency meeting in which the EQB member agencies and public members went through a results-based accountability exercise to determine the metrics for each section of the report. And the board landed on three metrics for each section, and I'll go through those later. Uh, but in, in 2018 and 2019, EQB updated and refined the report card using the same metrics and features. So next. So a little background on the results-based accountability, or RBA. Uh, as I mentioned, we utilized this to come up with the metrics for the report card. Uh, so results-based accountability, if you're familiar, is a framework that uses data to explore accountability at the population and program levels. Um, we have three components of that. That's communication power, which is basically how much power does a metric have to effectively communicate an issue. Uh, proxy power is how well does the metric represent the broader picture of the subject area. And then data power, how comprehensive is the available? How long has it been collected and how often will it be collected in the future? And so in 2012, the board went through a whole day long process looking at all those components and weighing them and landed on the metrics we currently see in 2017 and 2019 report. So, next slide, please. So, here's an image of the report card from 2019 that's also in your packets. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the metrics were chosen through an extensive interagency dialogue. And represent a collaborative effort to comprehensively evaluate Minnesota's environment, energy, uh, kind of report card picture. Uh, the criteria are based on environmental and social data and were chosen to help tell this larger story about trends, challenges, and opportunities for action. Uh, in many cases, the metrics are tied to official state or federal goals. Uh, the metric criteria details are in your packet on page 29 and 33. Um, and these metrics were both used in both 27 and 2019. The next page. So here's just a picture of the report card. Uh, we've got green, yellow, and red at the top there. So, and you'll see that in the next couple slides that I'll go through. And if you're looking in your packet or at the actual report card, you can kind of see each metric has a score and then a trend. Uh, and so green represents a good current status, or in other words, that performance is ahead of the desired progress towards state or national goals or established benchmarks. Yellow represents an okay status, or in other words, performance nearly meets public expectations or desired progress towards state or national goals. And red means a poor status and that we're well behind expectations or desired progress towards those state and or federal goals or industry or agency benchmarks. And then each goal or each metric, sorry, has also the an arrow that shows kind of the trend. So an up arrow means things are getting better. Yellow means or flat and things are about the same. And red means things are getting worse. And in your packets there, there's a whole prep in as well as on the EQB website, there's a whole bunch of criteria that agency technical experts went through a process to determine, you know, how do we determine when something's good, you know okay or poor and then how do we determine the trend and that's all available in your packets there um, so next slide so now i'm just going to briefly go through each of the sections um, uh, in the past when eqb staff has presented the the e and e report we've gone into each section and each metric quite a bit more uh, with technical experts in the room to answer any sort of really uh, in the weeds or specific questions. But today I'm just going to keep it pretty high level because I'd rather get to some of the options EQB staff sees going forward, as well as hear from the board on ideas um, on where we should head with this project. Um, so this is the climate section, which includes metrics on heat and rainfall, greenhouse gas emissions, and climate change and wildlife. And this data was produced and provided by the PCA and the DNR. Um, and you can see on um, here, this is how it's laid out in the report. It has the status and the trend. And then, uh, you know, in 2019, we tried we updated it to give kind of a little whip on um, where it's headed in that trend or status. And you can see that, like for heat and rainfall, moving the needle on climate change takes a little bit closer. Uh, so, next slide, we've got energy. And that is focuses on three metrics. You've got renewable energy, household energy use, and transportation fuel. And this data was provided by the 
uh, Commerce in MnDOT. You can see what this looks like, or if you want to go into more details, you can unpack it. Next up, we have air. If you can go to the next slide. And so the air section focuses on three metrics, the air quality index, asthma, and public health and transit. Uh, we had, this data was provided by the Pollution Control Agency, the Department of Health, MnDOT, and Met Council. So next slide, please. I'm just kind of moving through these quickly. And if you, if you have any questions or want to discuss them later, you can. Uh, this section focuses on three water metrics uh, to really better understand the status of Minnesota's water. We have lake and river water quality, water use or sustainability, and then nitrate in Minnesota's waters. And this was data was provided by Pollution Control, Department of Ag, and the Department of Transit. Okay, and then next slide, please. The next slide is the land section. And so this has three metrics uh, that focus on pheasants and bird populations, land conversion, or in this case, we use colloquial uh, sprawl and then recycling. And this was provided by the DNR, Met Council, Department of Ag, and Pollution Control. Okay, so next slide, please. So over the uh, time that I've worked on the Environment and Energy Report Card, I participated in getting together the 2017 and the 2019 version. Uh, there's been lessons learned and some challenges as we have developed the report card. So one of the challenges is just that it's hard to get into Minnesota. Uh, there's many state reports, many more niche reports on specific topics, um, and we print about 1,500 copies of the report, and you know we run out of those or come close to running out of them. Uh, so they, there's kind of that, and it's also a limited kind of view on, on, on how long it, it, the, the metrics or the current status are. Um, it's difficult to determine how much it's utilized. Um, you know, anecdotally, uh, every time ETB staff has presented the report card, we've received positive feedback and comments that people use it for informing school groups and community groups, and it's a really great, like, simple overview, and that was really the goal of the report card, that was to have it plain language and something that any Minnesota could look at and kind of say, here's where we're headed, here's where we are with environment, and here's and energy, and here's where we're headed. Um, it was used for the 2019 Environmental Congress. Of, general overview document and sessions were held on it. Um, we presented to school groups and to U of M and community groups, and agencies. Um, just a little bit of data that we do have is that the 2019 report was visited, they were downloaded about 400 times. And the 2017 was report was visited or downloaded about 2,100 times. Um, and again, about 1,500 copies of each of those. And we're just about out of them. I think we have a box left of each. Um, and so then another lessons learned or challenges is the staff time. It's a lot of staff time that can be spent on updating the report card. Um, for the initial creation of the report card, ETB staff and interagency staff spent a couple months gathering all the interagency data and then held an RBA day-long workshop with the board to determine metrics. For the development of the 27th, Development of the 2017 version was pretty intensive for ETB and interagency staff uh, due to design, criteria establishment, and narrative development. Uh, the 2019 version was considerably less ETB and interagency staff time because we just really needed to get the newest data and update the narrative. Um, but we didn't do the full, like looking at what were the new, what could be new metrics, what should the criteria be. Uh, but we did spend a lot of time with design. We updated the design and tried to make it more uh, plain language, more usable for any Minnesota and picked it up. Um, and then another lesson learned is just those hard copy limitations, it's costly to print and limiting on who wants and uses hard copy versions. So that's just a couple of lessons learned. I could probably talk to you about it all day, uh, but I'll move on to the next slide. So uh, staff has had a lot of discussions on what different options we have for the 2023 report card. And this is just three options. There are other options, and I definitely uh, would love to hear input from the board or ideas on other options. But these are some options that the ETB staff has landed on in some of our discussions. So option one is uh, 
So we would sunset the project, which would free up time for EP and interagency staff to work on other things. And we, it was an executive order from more than a decade ago. And we would see it as a positive, good project, but time to move on to other, uh, other issues. Option two is to update or keep the current report and metrics and update those metrics, the data for those, uh, update the narrative uh, with the latest available data and focus on really only having a web version to cut down on printing costs and uh, the time for design with that um, and really use lessons learned uh, to kind of direct to specific audiences. So expand outreach and communication, really try and get it into people hands and get it to be a more usable product. And then option three uh, would require more board involvement and increased EQB and interagency staff time. And this option would really focus on an evaluation of the current metrics and kind of a recalibration and refocus. So we would want to look at developing new goals, possibly new metrics and criteria, um, utilize the RBA or similar process to come up with those metrics. Um, and this operation would uh, kind of conduct a whole full redesign and possible print version. But again, each, any of these are change, interchangeable. Um, and as I said, staff has had a lot of discussions on the trade-offs with each of these options, um, considering the value to the public and the EQB itself. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. What staff is recommending is that option two as a, as a way forward, which would be really we complete the report for release in January 2023 or around then December 2022 uh, to try and in advance of the 2023 legislative session as a, as a good kind of here is the status of Minnesota's environment and energy. Uh, use a similar design to the 2019 version with one metric per page, but really only do it as a web version that could be printable. So if you're interested in the energy section, you can print out three pages and do an exercise in your community or school or in a, in a group that you're presenting to, because we did hear a lot of feedback that people use it in those settings. Um, we would update the current metrics with the latest data. We'd update the status and trend uh, based on the new data and using the current criteria, uh, update section narratives, update graphics. We would look to link the overarching narrative to the MEPA 50th anniversary, which is next year. And so kind of help maybe frame the environment and energy report card more on where we've been in the last 50 years with MEPA. But we didn't have, I don't think we're thinking about new metrics just for you know what it was like 50 years ago versus now. But again, this is up to discussion and I would welcome that. Um, and so again, also focus more on communication and outreach to get into the hands of Minnesotans uh, and collect more data this time to see how we can, if the report card is used and who's using it and how try and come up with some metrics related to that or better tracking on that. And with that, I'll move to the next slide, which is just my kind of discussion point, which is I'd welcome some board feedback on options for the environment and energy report card. Um, go to the next slide. Um, just to remind you, that's the option that staff is kind of recommending. Again, today is not a decision item. It's just a discussion. Um, and I welcome any questions or feedback. Go ahead. Thank you. This is Chair Nelson. And again, I will uh, go to the board for questions. Raise your hand if you're in the room. Virtually do it if you're online. And I see a question from public member Pence. Uh, thanks for the overview. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and condense it. Um, I guess the first just basic question, when you talk about the trends, um, and sorry if I missed it, but are the trends an indication from the last report card or 10 years, or are they varying based on the different metrics? They, uh, thank you, board member Hintz for the question, Chair Nelson. Um, uh, so they're based on the action on each metric. And they're explained in this criteria document. So each one uh, relates uh, to different trends. So for different time periods. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah so like, for instance, water use is about 10 year trend and the three year rolling average. So they each are each are different. Um, and then just, I guess my general comment is 
looking through the 2019 version, that seems really helpful for getting a broad overview as a public board member coming into this new. Um, I have some experience trying to find a lot of dispersed data related to water and condense it into something usable, both for my organization, for the public, for talking with decision makers, and it's very difficult to get that in a comprehensive way. Uh, so I support the, I mean, I know there's no decision, but just generally support the second option of like, I think it's helpful to have something like this updated on a regular basis as a new board member and for those who would be interested in seeing that broad overview. Um, but, you know, maybe tailoring it to where it's going to be really useful within different organizations, schools, um, rather than trying to just, you know, send it out to every household or not that you guys are doing that, but, you know, being more tailored in the outreach. Other questions from the board? Chair Van Amber. Chair recognizes Vice Chair Van Amber. Yes, Chair Nelson and Eric. Uh, Eric, is there a, uh, a literature cited section to, to this uh, that's possible? You know, when I, when I look at data like this, I, I, I try and look at where it's coming from otherwise. And uh, I find that really valuable. Uh, my purposes anyway, uh, and I wonder if that's if that's possible. If there's anything like that, I, you know, I'm I'm sitting here right now, reading reading one. In fact, the uh, Buffalo River and Upper Red River of the North Watersheds, looking at their their update on on water quality, and, and there must be maybe it's just so much you can't do it. I don't know. Uh, Member Van Amberg, uh, Chair Nelson, thank you for the question. Um, there, we didn't put it with the the kind of sim the printed final short version, uh, but that is available, and I can share that with you. Uh, in the, I believe I don't have the 2017 version here, but in the 2017 version, I think for each section we put like a list of each of the, um, the data or data sources or uh, sources related to it. But we were trying to cut down on space for the 2019 version didn't include that, but I could definitely get that information to you or any other board members that are interested in that. I, I was just thinking it might be nice if it was just available on the web only. Okay. As, as a list I, I for people to go to if they really want it. I, I think this this was taken to the public. It was in 2011. Did they go around the state to present this? Because I remember here, I think it was that first, first year perhaps. Uh, Board member Van Amberg, unfortunately, I wasn't here in 2011. I can't remember. Maybe someone else here can. But uh, I, when I looked up kind of some of the history of it, I saw a lot of pictures of them going around the state. They held uh, meetings to talk with uh, public, you know, the public around the state. Uh, the governor went around with commissioners and had discussions on like what should the sections be. Um, but I wasn't here for that. Uh, and that 2012 version was more focused on kind of the sections and a narrative around the sections. There weren't like these kind of um, where now we have the red, yellow, green kind of, you know, grades in a sense. There, that first version was more of this narrative and we kind of reimagined that in the 2017 version. Um, but if, unless someone else is in the room or online can uh, comment on this. I don't, I, I wasn't here other than just kind of looking online, so. Well, I, I just recall it happening in Moorhead, and I, I was impressed with, uh, with the way it was presented. But I know that that's, you know, that's really time consuming. It takes a lot of, a lot of work and probably not possible. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes Nick Martin. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Eric. Um, I think the report card is really useful, and the thing that I kept thinking about as I looked at it was, since this was re released in 2019, based on primarily 2018 or earlier data, you know, obviously a lot has changed since 2018. Um, I know the probably the emissions and the energy parts best, um, 
but I think, you know, emissions have decreased significantly as the economy collapsed, but then that's going to, of course, come back. Um, I'm sure there are, you know, similar things in the other other areas that the report card um, reports on. And then I, th I think about also, you know, like you could think about, you know, transportation emissions probably went way down as people started staying home. Now we're in an era of higher gas prices and more electric vehicles. So hopefully those won't recover to the same extent. So I just, you know, you could think of many other examples like that, but I just, it seems valuable to me to keep looking at these metrics as the economy recovers. And of course, it won't be entirely simple because we're now in a environment of higher inflation and a lot of supply chain challenges and everything like that too. So how will those things affect these metrics? Uh, maybe not all of that would even be captured in the next um, update because it might, you know, be still seeing a lot of the years being reported on might really be pandemic years still, and almost argues for thinking a couple updates down the line. So I don't know if you, have, you know, there's necessarily any response to that, but those just seem to me like reasons to continue seeing how Minnesota's economy rebounds and what changes and what recovers, hopefully emissions don't recover, but you know, I don't think we know that yet. Thank you, board member Mark. Yeah, I was actually thinking about that with the, uh, in the um, ener energy, or no, not energy, the, there's the one, oh, in air transit ridership, because in 2019, we were red and we were going down, meaning that the state ridership was less than 95% of targeted ridership and statewide ridership growth was growth was less than targeted growth. And so thinking about like the pandemic and how that impacted transit. Um, there are I think it would be really interesting to look at that for all of these metrics to see. Um, but transit made me think that probably is not going in the right direction. The chair recognizes Commissioner Stroman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just one thought on this, and I, you know, I, I think um, the recommendation can make a lot of sense. I think one thing that I would also suggest um, that we look at is um, how this report card complements uh, other report cards that are out there. So, um, you know, we have obviously the climate report that's going to be tied to the climate action plan. Um, this governor has his one Minnesota plan and some metrics, particularly around climate. And so I think when we say, you know, this is for an audience of the public and policymakers, you know, to me, those aren't really the same audiences. The, the public might be interested and we might be interested in getting the information out to the public as a transparency measure so that people understand how we are doing as a state um, to things. I think you know, for me in the role that I sit, um, when we look at it, and we had the same conversation with our DNR <laughs> performance metrics, what do we need to look at, right, at, at our executive leadership level versus what do our program management staff need to understand about their program performance metrics? Um, and then it's like, well, at what level do we need to understand? And, and so maybe we have to shift, right, direction on how we're um, conducting the work to, to bend the curve on something. And so I just would encourage us to really think about are we focused on the transparency to the public piece? Are we focused on the, the you know, us as decision makers or, or the legislature as decision makers or the governor as a decision maker? And um, then it's like, okay, so what do you do with that information, right? And, and then make sure that it's adding to or complementing the other report cards that some of those audiences are already using um, versus, you know, sort of throwing it out there and hoping that this is the one they will they will choose to use because the, the reality is many of those audiences have their own report cards or you know metrics that they're using and so i think if we're going to spend time we want to make sure that it is you know to an end that is going to be useful to somebody either to be able to assess where we're at and you know change programmatic focus to to do better and get to the the target or um you know help the public understand the situation. And then it's sort of like the question for the public is, okay, if we're not meeting a metric, what do I do about it? <laughs> As a member of the public, who do I call or what do I do? So I just, I would encourage that to be part of that thought process and, and review too. I think these can be really powerful tools, but I think you kind of have to go all the way through of who's using them and what other tools do they have at their disposal. 
Uh, chair recognizes public member Joseph Bauer. <laughs> Say that for me. Howard Kimber, yeah, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Eric, for the presentation. Um, my question has to do with, I think it was maybe option three, uh, perhaps one that's not recommended by the staff that included, I believe, a gesture toward a kind of fundamental revisiting what the metrics are. Um, and I'm curious if that arises out of a discussion. Uh, you know, what is what is the conversation surrounding the selection of the metrics that presumably need to be sustained over time in order to have comparative value? Um, but what is the discussion surrounding the the selection of the metrics and the evolution of that? And is it realistic to fundamentally revisit that? Can you say a little bit about uh, about that um, option three that? You know, as noted, is probably not recommended, but I'm nevertheless curious. Uh, thank you, uh, Board Member Bauer Camper. Said that right, I believe. Uh, thank you for the question. That's uh, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about uh, other metrics um, and the amount of work and uh, it would take. Um, I think you know, uh, I could talk about quite a bit other metrics. I think would be interesting. You know, the board we wrote a report on. Emerald dashboard, but we don't really have a metric related to that. Uh, or we have a, you know, we're going to hear about pollinators next, and we don't really have a, a metric related to pollinators. I think there's a lot of options for um, expanding um, the metrics, um, but I also know that that would be, a, uh, it was quite a bit of EQB staff work, but it, would, it was a substantial amount of work for interagency staff to put together the, all the data and track track down the data and then um, kind of reconfigure the, the goals around that. Um, but it is a really appealing thing to me too, but it's not really my, my decision uh, to do that. It's really the board and I, I, I welcome your direction on that. Uh, but I think, you know, even around land and, you know, recycling, is that the best metric or is waste generation a, a better metric? Uh, you know, we use land conversion, um, but are there better metrics around uh, development patterns? Um, you know, I think that it's kind of a, a really fun rabbit hole to go down. Um, and I don't have a, the best answer, on that. but I, I'll, I'll invite any other board members to answer or executive director Pratt if you have any insight on that. Too. Yeah, I can just chime in and, and we've talked about it a lot as a team. You know, one of the interesting things is, you know, what what data is, is really available as a state and available consistently enough to create a, a metric that you would report out over time on. And that in itself of just understanding what data is out there and who has it and how consistent it is and how it's generated, even that is kind of a, a project in and of itself and takes tap, staff time to even explore. You know, I would say over the history of, of this project, since I've known it, you know, that's one of the first things people talk about, right? They, they get this report and they say, well, why this metric? Or why not this other thing? Why aren't we measuring that? And, you know, it leads to really interesting conversations and really interesting discussions um, in terms of, you know, are the metrics that are currently in the report, are they the best metrics that tell the best story and help us, help the public best understand where we're at as Minnesota and guide thinking and guide conversation? You know, I, I don't know. We don't know the answer to that. And I, I don't know how you would even kind of come to the answer whether these are the best ones or whether there's others out there. There could be interesting models where you, um, you know, each iteration you pilot a new metric and maybe don't overhaul the whole thing, but maybe if there's a kind of a gap in the data that people have said, we, we really want to see more data on this, staff could spend time exploring and see what they came up with on a pilot basis. So I think there's interesting interesting ideas we're just sensitive to um you know to the amount of time it takes and and it's not all just eqb staff time it's you know data experts really around the state and all our member agencies who have you know have other priorities and, and things that they're working on um so yeah this is a good conversation and um you know we welcome your creative creative thinking to or if you're really curious about a particular metric you know we welcome those conversations It chair recognizes Commissioner Kessler. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? We can. You're soft, but we can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, 
Well, I I think uh, Commissioner Stroman said a lot of what I was going to say, but I didn't feel like trying to figure out how to lower my hand. I think it's important <laughs> that you think about um, the audience and what can be most powerful. And I commend you on actually putting as an option sunsetting the report. That's not what I'm recommending, but I think in state government too often we get on this path of producing these reports and we never take the opportunity to say, is this the best use of our time or the best use of our abilities to communicate this need or these data? And so um, I think it also recognizing that we live almost entirely in a digital world, I commend you for thinking about moving that way. I don't know that you need to spend time printing hard copies given the way that we've evolved since you know this started. Uh, and I do think to the point of what can be of most value for the board and the report going forward, thinking about if there's a specific, if you're gonna keep doing the report, is there a specific focus and I think you had mentioned it's the 50th anniversary of Mira um, that could spur conversations or um, additional interest in work that we have ongoing that is also highlighted in the report. I think you're going to get more traction if it's something that is um, somewhat outside of the regular sphere of usual suspects who look at this stuff. So uh, I'm glad you're taking the opportunity to think about like strategically, how do you best use your time and, and this going forward? Thank you, Commissioner Kessler. Um, public member Hintz. Yeah, thanks. I had a, a couple other thoughts and I definitely appreciate, you know, thinking about refining the, the audience and not adding another report to the table. But I think communicating with the public is so challenging the immense amount of data that exists. Um, and there's nothing like a good, you know, media opportunity with the 50th anniversary uh, coming up where there might just naturally be a lot more conversation about what we've done. And so having that information ready to go, I think would be important. Uh, I also think bringing up COVID that many more people than I anticipated were just talking about the environment and what's changed. And so that's something I think would be really interested in is just you know what is what are the benefits of people staying from home and, and can they actually look and find some metrics across the state that are showing that data and allowing people to have some interesting conversations about uh, some of the side effects of COVID so it, it does feel like maybe for this next one there's a couple other things happening in our world that could lift it up and highlight it and make it more interesting for the public um, the other thing that's come up for me recently in some discussions and the 50 year anniversary reminds me of that is that there's kind of a segment of the population that sees that we have made a lot of progress in our environment and you know cleaned up our water and we're not dumping raw sewage into the rivers anymore and so that is sometimes an excuse for well then you know why do we need to continue to invest in this we've already made so much progress but then on the other side of things, it's also people need to feel inspired that it is possible to make big environmental changes. And so um, maybe this anniversary is an opportunity to include some of that in the narrative beyond just like the most recent metrics, but also talk about trying to find that careful communication balance of like, we are able to come together and make significant changes and our world looks different than it did 50 years ago. And here's what what the current focuses are. So something around that that tries to strike that balance. I'm gonna um, move on here pretty quickly, but I do have just a few certain comment points for myself. We can go back to the slide with, with the options. Is there any way to do that real quickly? I, I think this is a good conversation. When, whenever we, we have things and we want to continuously improve, it's good to sort of question that. I think an earlier meeting this year when you had your, your work plan for the year, um, um, Executive Director Pratt, I asked how the staffing level was and how comfortable you were tackling that um, work plan and the agenda, and you said it was tight. So I, I don't think this is the year to take on new design and, and so forth or the biennium to do that. So I, I am um, supportive of option two. You're not looking for a board vote today 
Um, but that's where I would come down. I think the key though is what you were saying with how you would measure or try to get more feedback on its on its use. So if it comes back to the board and we're gonna say, okay, was it valuable? We do, we do, but we'll need that information. So uh, with that, unless there's any objection, I'm going to um, move forward to the next agenda item. And thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Nelson. I was just gonna say, so next I'll kind of take this data and uh, we'll have a conversation and then uh, you know, come back to the board, um, launch the project, or kind of come back with more uh, information, kind of determination by the board. So, thank you very much for your time today. So, the next agenda item is update from the interagency pollinator protection team, and I believe that's Dave Proxted again, and a new person for us, uh, Christina Watt. I could just add one more thing. Again, informational, no, no decision. But again, I think you wanted to have a little bit of a, a discussion. Um, we still are reasonably on time, but we can't go too long without going over. So, Thank you, Chair Nelson, uh, members of the board and members of the public. Hello again. I'm Faith Craigstead, um, Engagement and Communication Director at the Environmental Quality Board, and I'm here with my colleague, Christina Locke. Uh, the Pollinator Conservation Coordinator at the Department of Natural Resources. And I just want to say that um, Christina is a fairly new employee to state government. And when um, the state pollinator coordinator at the Environmental Quality Board, Rebecca Gutierrez Moreno, said she would be unable to make it today and was asking for people who could present this, um, Christina volunteered. So hats off to Christina for um, her willingness to jump right in. Uh, feed first and uh, help us out with this presentation. Um, so we're here on behalf of the Interagency Pollinator Protection Team to give an update to the Environmental Quality Board. You can go to the next slide. Um, in our presentation today, we'll give some background on interagency pollinator work, um, talk about the developing, I'll hand it off to Christina to talk about developing pollinator action framework that the team is working on. And then I will invite you to a very exciting event in June, the 2022 Pollinator Week kickoff that will be happening at Spring Lake Park um, near Hastings on June 15th. Next slide, please. So first, I just wanted to ground everyone in uh, pollinators. Who are we talking about when we're talking about pollinators in the state? Many times our minds go immediately to honeybees and honeybees are very important pollinators. Um, but I wanted to make sure we also um, mentioned that there are thousands of species of pollinators in the state, including uh, butterflies, flies, bees, beetles, moths, wasps, etc. and on and on. Um, and there is just a great diversity of these species. And there are some photos here from a previous report from the Interagency Pollinator Protection Team um, showcasing some of this diversity here. Um, we know probably the most about um, honeybees. Honeybees are a managed pollinator species as opposed to a wild species. Um, so it's one of these species that you can, you can learn about regularly because they conveniently are in a hive box. You can open the lid and look inside and see what's going on in there. Um, so uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. A little bit more background. Uh, we know that pollinators are in trouble. Um, many pollinator species are are uh, affected by multiple stressors, including climate change, loss or fragmentation of their natural habitat, diseases and parasites, and non-target impacts of pesticides. And these do not um, affect them in isolation. These interact with each other and have detrimental effects on pollinator health. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how pollinators are important. They are vital to life on this planet. They uh, pollinate flowering plants. Um, on landscapes. And, you know, we think a lot about how pollinators um, pollinate our food crops. About um, one in every uh, food crop is, um, let's see here, a third of our food crops are animal pollinated, mostly by bees. Um, so we have a photo here of a person picking some, some apples, so a lot of fruits, nuts, etc. cetera. Um, but they also are important in our, on our lands. They, they pollinate um, our native plants and um, those plants in turn contribute to clean water, 
healthy soil and resilient ecosystems. Um, pollinators are also important in food chains. So we see the chickadee there with the, the caterpillar in its mouth. So providing food to birds and other wildlife. Um, and of course, honey is, is also on here. Um, they are also important culturally uh, to us and serve as icons and, and um, important cultural touchstones for many communities and cultures. Next slide, please. So I'll give a quick background on interagency pollinator work. Um, agencies have been working on pollinator issues for some time, but in 2016, Governor Dayton um, issued an executive order that established the interagency pollinator protection team. Um, and then in 2019, Governor Walls um, renewed that executive order um, and it was uh, modified a bit to incorporate some of the work that the interagency team had done previously. Um, there's a, just a few highlights of action that the interagency team has collaborated on, um, and I won't go through all of these, but um, you know, some more high profile things that to raise awareness, you might have seen pollinator license plates, critical habitat license plates out um, in the street. Uh, the, the, bee, the rusty patch bumblebee is on a lottery ticket. Um, there's the Lawns to Legends program that is um, helping to get um, some native plants on, into people's residential yards, et cetera. So a lot of really exciting work um, has, has happened as a result of, of these executive orders. Next slide, please. Throughout this work, we have um, been engaging with the public. The first uh, executive order established the Governor's Committee on Pollinator Protection, and that was comprised of 15 members um, of the public with diverse backgrounds and experiences when it comes to pollinators, so agriculture, academia, conservation, et cetera. And that group issued a, a set of recommendations for pollinator protection. There was not necessarily consensus on, on those ideas, but what it did for us is helped us understand um, where there were challenges for some of these um, recommendations, where, where uh, people had concerns or where there was uh, more consensus on, on ideas. Um, in the second executive order, um, the public engagement uh, transferred to a civic engagement process. So um, that is something that Rebecca and the interagency team has been working on creating this process and implementing this process to collect feedback from members of the public on our annual reports that we put out and some other, other ways that we're um, connecting with the public. Next slide. I mentioned the annual reports, and um, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to explain the direction that we're, we're going in this year for our report. Um, each year, the, the team puts out um, a report to talk about, you know, what, what is happening, what's the status of things, um, you know, what, what action is the team working on, um, what progress is being made, what recommendations, and those have been pretty broad. Um, but also each year, there's been, there's been a little bit of, of movement on um, planning. So in 2017, they established these goals that, um, that guide our work. Uh, so the goals are around habitat. Actually, I'll let Christina talk about those later. Um, but all of these things are additive. So in 2018, we talked about what outputs do we want to drive um, with, within each goal. In 2019, we uh, developed metrics and scorecards uh, to help us understand how we're doing, how pollinators are doing, um, and help the public uh, kind of keep tabs on, on what's going on as well. Um, and then in 2020, um, really articulating the progress and challenges uh, so far, and then 2021, incorporating that public feedback that we collected through that civic engagement process. And we also collected some stories of action for the um, And when you add all of that together, what we felt like we needed in order to accelerate progress was to create a framework of action, um, of strategy that will help us to reach the goals that we have identified. And I'll hand it off to Christina at this point to talk about the developing pollinator action. Thanks. Um, thank you, Faith. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Again, my name is Christina Locke from the Department of Natural Resources, and I'll talk um, a little bit more about the action framework as it stands right now. So next slide, please. So as Faith mentioned, this is really guided by the governor's executive order that the 
the 2019 executive order was called Restoring Healthy, Diverse Pollinator Populations that Sustain and Enhance Minnesota's Environment, Economy, and Way of Life. So a lot in there. Um, and there are three main goals uh, embedded in that, in that executive order. Goal one being that land, Minnesota lands support pollinators. Goal two, that pesticides are used judiciously and only when necessary. And goal three, that Minnesotans understand, value, and actively support pollinators. Next slide, slide, please. So the structure that we're using for this framework, it goes from broad scope on the left-hand side of this slide to more narrow, um, specific action on the right. So each, each goal um, in that executive order, we have uh, categories of work um, falling under that goal. And then to the far right, those actions are not only actions that we as state agencies have authority to undertake, but also things that might be led by our partner, external partners and collaborators. So for the purposes of this talk, we'll, we'll keep it fairly high level at the goal and, and category level. Next slide, please. So the next few slides will have the goal in the green box on the left and the categories that fall under that goal in the blue boxes on the right. So for goal number one, land support pollinators, the key output is more food sources for pollinators. And the categories we have are protected habitats. So that would be um, acquiring conservation easements on private lands or fee simple acquisitions on public lands um, that harbor pollinator habitat or could potentially harbor pollinator habitat. The next category of work, um, restored and created habitat. Those would be projects that start with bare earth and involve um, vegetating that land um, in order to attract pollinators. So some of our agencies call that habitat restoration, some call it habitat creation. So we've got both um, in that category. Enhanced habitat uh, has to do with already vegetated land, um, but changing the management practices on that land, whether that involves fire or mowing practices or interseeding, um, things like that to, to make that land even more attractive attractive to pollinators. Next slide, please. Goal number two, use of pesticides is judicious and only when necessary. The key output there is reduced pesticide impacts to pollinators through integrated pest management or IPM practices. So the practices around pesticides we have separated out um, for agricultural settings and non-agricultural settings because the actions having to do with those practices are going to vary depending on on the setting. And then that third category there, robust protections, has less to do with uh, practices and more to do with policies and programs. So for example, a program that uh, is geared towards pesticide applicators um, to help them comply with existing pesticide regulations, that is something that might fall under that category. Next, uh, next slide, please. Goal three, Minnesotans understand, value, and actively support pollinators. Key output there is more community action on pollinator protection efforts. So um, we've got some really feel good, wonderful, as Faith mentioned earlier with the EELS program, these are some of the programs that are really, really exciting and hopeful and, and involve the public. Um, we've got uh, a few different categories here. Uh, the first, diverse and inclusive public participation. We're, we're really talking about um, making the process more democratic here. We don't want uh, these pollinator protection efforts uh, to happen without public feedback and without public knowledge. And that goes hand in hand with the second category there, effective public access to information. We want these to be trans, uh, transparent processes. Um, as far as the IPPT goes, we want uh, the information we're using to make uh, decisions and recommendations available to, to the public as well so they know what, what's going on. Um, sustained education and training. These are programs that could be community science, uh, train the trainer initiatives, um, workshops. Uh, these tend to have highly engaged participants and we'd love to support programs like that, that um, people get really engaged and in for the long haul. And, that, and those are different kinds of things than what we're talking about in the fourth category here, widespread public awareness. Those are more visibility campaigns, uh, a broader, shallower reach um, and the things like the, the lottery ticket with the rest of cash bumblebee on it and the, um, the license plate would fall there. Next slide, please. All right, our fourth, fourth focus here, um, these things are really about making sure we have the right knowledge, tools, and strategies to undertake this work and um, lead to the desired outcome of healthy, diverse pollinator populations. 
So informed decision making here, we're talking about making sure that we have the best information possible to, um, to make recommendations or um, create these action items we're talking about. Um, if there are gaps in knowledge about the biology or habitat preferences or what have you that's preventing us from making a good, clear decision, uh, we need to identify those knowledge gaps. Strategic protections, we're talking about um, taking a hard look at the protections we have in place for pollinators and making sure those are the correct protections for the, the species that need them the most. Um, and making sure those protections are doing what they intend to do, which would be um, improving pollinator health by increasing population sizes. Efficient coordination. This is more about working with our partners and collaborators, and there are a lot of pollinator effort, efforts happening simultaneously in Minnesota, and that's wonderful, but we need to know who's doing what and who, who's, uh, uh, we shouldn't be duplicating efforts. We should be working together um, towards common goals. And that goes along with long-term planning. Um, we don't want to be rehashing the same arguments or um, decisions that with every executive order or with every funding cycle, we should be building on um, efforts uh, from the past and evolving from there. Next slide, please. Okay, developing the framework. Um, so this is uh, an update to our civic engagement process. We are looking to use the Engagement HQ platform to garner um, public feedback on the on pollinators in general and the action um, issues related to the action framework. Uh, specifically, um, opening uh, opening this up coming up really soon in June, June and July this summer. Um, simultaneously, uh, we would like to get feedback from Focus. Uh, subject matter experts um, with the intention of incorporating that feedback into a draft action uh, framework that we would uh, present to the board in November. And that's ahead of the December release of the annual report, which would also include that draft action framework. Um, we want to continue garnering public feedback um, once that annual report is out. And then with the goal of uh, in 2023, finalizing that framework and um, working on an implementation plan. And I'm going to pass it back to Faith uh, to talk about an upcoming event. All right, next slide. Thanks, Christina. So I would like to invite everyone here uh, to our Pollinator Week kickoff. International Pollinator Week this year is June 20th to the 26th. And in advance of that, we are hosting this to raise awareness about Pollinator Week in Minnesota. Um, it is at a beautiful location overlooking the St. Croix River um, at Spring Lake Park Reserve on Wednesday, June 15th from 11.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. And uh, we will have remarks from county and state leadership. Um, it is, this is being held at the same time as the, normally the, the EQB board meeting would be held. So um, hopefully you'll have time on your calendar to, to join us. Um, we will have some keynote speakers, uh, Marla Spiva from the U of M C Lab, Eric Runquist, who is on the Interagency Pollinator Protection Team. He is speaking, he, he works for the Minnesota Zoo. Wendy Caldwell from Monarch Joint Center. And then the Department of Natural Resources has been uh, working with students in the area to implement pollinator um, habitat on school lands. And so the students will be coming to present their work um, and then we'll have an exhibitor fair and hands-on activities, including a bumblebee survey during that day. So we, we really hope you all join us and uh, because we know the weather will be perfect. Um, and um, and, and we, we hope to have a lot of fun. So any, if, if there are any questions at this time uh, from the board about the uh, developing pollinator action framework or this event, we're here to answer them. Thank you, Faith and Christina. Um, there's a little more time was set in the agenda for discussion here, so I'm, I'm anticipating that you had some specific things you kind of wanted to pick from us. Could you highlight one or two, or is it? We didn't intend for this to be a discussion item, so we did not bring discussion questions. However, this topic generally does um, inspire a lot of questions and comments, and so we wanted to make sure there was 
So I'll open it again to the board members uh, in the room. Raise your hand virtually. Uh, virtually raise your hand. So I guess chair recognizes. Is it commissioner? I, it's, I'm standing in. Standing in. <laughs> no, no fish. Thank you, uh, Chair Nelson. I have a question that sort of overlaps into what Eric presented. Um, Commissioner Stroman talked about, okay, we do all these reports in, in different parts of different agencies, and how do they kind of tie back into the report card? Do you have any kind of thoughts about that topic with this particular report, and then just having heard from Eric on the report card? I think that would be a great question for Rebecca Gutierrez Moreno, who's the state pollinator coordinator, <laughs> and we can certainly bring that back to her uh, for consideration. I mean, I can chime in too. You know, the so first of all, the environment and energy report card predated the pollinator work, and the pollinator work really came online as kind of a a, a niche issue where it wasn't there, there wasn't kind of a gap in how agencies were, um, you know, addressing pollinators, and the report is just one aspect of the pollinator work. You know, there's a lot of interagency coordination work going on, but I mean, I think I think this is a broader issue that we see across our member agencies and at EQB is, you know, this need for public information. We know there's a need for public information. The public wants transparency. They want to understand these issues. Um, and different agencies hold different pieces of the puzzle. And, and some of that is cross-agency. And so how do you align, um, how do you align the needs that the public has with Information that the state has, and I think it's going to be an ongoing puzzle and an ongoing issue, and and um, and then how EQB sits in that intersection. And you know, I think one of the things with the Environment and Energy Report Card that came up in our staff uh, staff discussion is, to our knowledge, it's the only report created by state government that is both cross agency and cross media. So it's also, you know, maybe there are others that others might know of. So trying to really look at is this a report or is this a effort that is hitting a niche, you know, a, a niche um, that isn't being covered elsewhere. And then I think the flip side of that is, as I think, you know, board members were bringing up is how do you make sure that's connecting with that same audience that wants that type of information in that way? So I think it's good. These are good questions and good puzzles and, you know, welcome all the creative thinking from, from the board. Uh, I'll also say that our, our scorecard um, was very challenging to develop. And um, what we found is that there's really, uh, the, our, our sources of information and data are really limited. Um, and it's, it, is a, it is a complex thing to undertake. So, you know, if you're, you know, the DNR and you're looking at, you want to understand deer, you know, that's one species. You know, here we are, we have thousands of species probably with many different um, habitat needs and, and whatnot. And, you know, so, Creating a scorecard for that, you know, is something has been a challenge because we have to come up with something that's useful to us um, and also useful to the public, um, but is it's not going to be perfect at all. Um, and so I, I would just, um, it, it, and it's also something that we don't get new data necessarily very frequently. So um, again, on that timeline question that you asked about the, the metrics, um, that can be a challenge too to make sure that those align. Chair recognizes Commissioner Kessler. Thanks. Um, I think the event sounds really fun and a good opportunity to celebrate the work. I would just note, and I'm sure you're thinking about this, that there are a number of members on the, at least the House Environment Natural Resources Committee that are very keen on this work and would probably appreciate being included. And we can talk separately about that. Um, if that would be helpful, Faith or others who are planning that. Thank you, board member Kessler. That sounds like a great idea. I do have a couple observations or questions for myself here. Um, in my experience, you know, before I retired, um, was in uh, working with private land and conservation. And um, I looked it up once that I think it's 76 to 78% of the land in Minnesota is privately owned. So 
I, I would emphasize that there sort of needs to be a focus on that, particularly in the, in the habitat part of that. I acknowledge, I think Bowser is doing a very good job with, with the native plant uh, mixes and requirements for, for their practices and land set aside programs. But in, yesterday, as I was doing some uh, plumbing repair, I had to go out and buy stuff. And as I went to the hardware store and other places, there, there's signs all over about native uh, plant sales, so forth. Um, and my 92 year old mother um, talked her um, co op into doing part of their area native landscaping and so forth. So, so I think there, and maybe I'm wrong, that there is a fairly good level of awareness out there. And, and it's good to see that you acknowledge there's a difference between awareness and the other parts of reaching out. Public. And, and what I suggest is, is that since it seems to me, but others can confirm this or not, that there is a, a good level of awareness, but awareness is not what makes people act. And, and so you need to get into, I think, building the capacity for people to act. And, there, and there's a couple layers of, of that. From my experience, one is that you know people want to do things, but they don't know how to get started. So so how do, how do you get started? How do you build that capacity? Whether it's at SWC offices to have the expertise to translate that to, to the folks or to the master gardeners and so forth. So there's that whole train the trainer training types of thing to, to build that. Um, but also because this is a executive order rather than a legislative appropriation, I think we really need to work on those people who, who want to act but don't don't know how to do that. And, and the other side of that is one of the biggest things, and we found this statistically, that keeps people from acting is they don't believe it will make a difference. So stories, you had mentioned stories. So building that whole capacity for people to believe is a whole part of that communication or outreach effort, in my mind more so than, than the awareness. Um, and that, that means, again, technical assistance, enough going on that people see their neighbor doing it um, and they believe that cumulatively this can add up. So um, with that, I'll stop preaching. Um, thank you. This is, this is a topic that's very interesting to me. Well, let member Hintz. Thanks. Um, just building off of that idea, I'm curious if you have any like maps or pilot areas of specific communities where the community has come together and done more native plantings where you might actually be able to see some measurements in terms of both pollinators but also you know are there more songbirds in the area because of that that like what would a community member what would maybe a more direct benefit to the community member even beyond just i feel good that i'm seeing these beautiful flowers that attract pollinators is there any Sort of pilot that could be done that would showcase that or is already being done? The Bowser has the Lawn to Legumes yeah. program that, and they have um, one one of the areas of, of grants that they have, I can't remember, it's the neighborhood or something yeah. like that. So um, I think, you know, we could ask them um, what what they're learning from that. And I'm sure they're, they're talking to people who, you know, the grantees to find out. Um, you know how that's how that's been going and what what changes that people are seeing. I don't know that there's any sort of uh, monitoring that's happening to to learn about um, you know bird species or anything like that. So that's an interesting idea. I'll add that I this is going to be terrible because I don't even remember what city it was, but um, there was a, a university group. They did a very small project, but they were looking at the effect of no mow May and comparing onset. Um, of people who were participating to those that didn't and their proximity to parks and found way, way higher pollinator diversity um, near the areas that were that were participating in Lomay. So there's isolated projects like that that I have I come across from time to time. Um, I would love to collect more stories like that. That's a really great idea for you know highlighting bright spots to, to model actions after. Chair recognizes Nicholas Martin. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I'm curious, you know, uh, planting of native grasses can lead to, uh, you know, significant low ground carbon sequestration, depending, of course, on, you know, what species are planted and how big the scale is, and also depending on what the baseline land use is. But I'm just curious, has there been uh, thought about whether this activity potentially links to the climate action framework, the working lands um, uh, group work on carbon sequestration in Minnesota landscapes? Um, and, you know, can, can these projects sort of complement those goals as well, or even link to, um, you know, carbon credit markets that might provide uh, financing for those kind of activities? Thank you for that question, Board Member Martin. I am not sure if the Natural and Working Lands Group has considered that as part of the work. I don't know if Board Member Stroman knows the answer to that um, specifically. But, Mr. Chair, I, I I can just what I will say is that I think you know the reality at DNR is we try to manage our lens for or our lands with multiple lenses. So pollinators being one of them, climate being one of them, water quality being one of them. And so um, I would have to review the climate action framework. I'm not sure it specifically mentions pollinator actions, but yes, that is always a goal is to find those complementary and um, multiple benefits on the land we manage. So I would suspect in many cases, um, you know, the lands, uh, the grasslands that we manage um, are providing habitat for pollinators and they are providing uh, carbon benefits and they're providing water quality benefits and they're providing habitat for other species and recreational opportunities. So um, yes, that's, that, yes, is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes, the chair recognizes. Uh, you I'm can sure you're trying to look at Thank you, Chair Nelson. I would just add something to, to this topic. Um, on large scale solar sites, there's a lot of effort around beneficial habitat and looking at stackable benefits. And at Commerce, we've put together an interagency group, which includes DNR and Bowser. And collectively, we've had the opportunity to, to apply for a DOE grant in a sort of a partnership role with Argonne National Laboratories. There's been no decision. We're working on the grant proposal right now, but the focus of that particular grant is, is these stackable benefits. And um, what we're looking at pursuing is more standardized methods of measuring below ground carbon sequestration at these sites. So it's native habitat, it's pollinator habitat. It's got the stackable benefits that uh, Commissioner Stroman talked about. And the effort is to really characterize the, and, and quantify the below ground carbon storage and for uh, board member Martin, there is as part of that effort, we're looking at connections to carbon markets. That's something that's happening. That's that's we good to hear, Louise. I, um, I don't represent Xcel Energy on the EQB, but I work for Xcel Energy and we have um, uh, requested pollinator habitat on all of our new solar RFPs. So we're looking to promote pollinator habitat, but you know, between the panels and all these new projects um, and also look at below ground carbon sequestration. So that we'd certainly be interested in that. We meaning Excel, not me as an EQB member, but um, if you're not in touch with Excel about that, um, we could certainly talk more about that. Can you let us know the outcome of your grant application when you hear? Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Huh? Thank you. Thank you. And so we're on to public comment. Yeah, and I, I can go ahead and, and queue public comment and uh, members of the public, if you're joining online, um, I don't know that we have any public commenters in the room. I'm looking at my staff. Um, no, okay, so if you're joining online, please use the raise hand feature to identify yourself as wishing to make public comment. I'm just going to give that a minute. Um, I do know that we have one commenter, Willis Madison. Go ahead and I think uh, my team will unmute you. And go ahead and I introduce yourself and share your comment.
Willis, we're not able to hear you yet. We're still not hearing you. I'm looking at my team. Yeah, yeah, mute is. Little green microphone. Shows you unmuted as unmuted, Willis. We're, we're going to try to troubleshoot. And I don't see any other members of the public with hands raised. Okay, Willis, any? Be on standby for a minute here, board, while we're seeing if there's any troubleshooting we can do. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any good options at this point. Team, any, any ideas? I think given that we're at the close of the meeting, we might just have to head on and, and apologize about the about the technical difficulty. Oh yeah, so so um, Willis, if you can hear me, you could put your your comment into the chat and we could at least read it on your behalf given the technical difficulties. I, I know you might not be able to put it all in there, but if you want to put a couple of highlights in and Maybe while that is um, happening, I, I could take a moment to um, recognize that. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, another suggestion might be if he has a longer comment, he just provide it via email and we yep. can address sure. it at the next board meeting because we don't have any imminent action on any of these items that were on today's agenda. So yeah, I think that that sounds good. So so Willis, you know, if you. Uh, since we can't unfortunately get you connected here, go ahead and send us a written comment via email and we'll make sure that fix is related and included in our packet as part of the public record as well. Um, I, I will I will stall for just a minute though in case he gets connected to, to acknowledge that um, some of you may have noticed a lovely gift, pollinator themed gift that we have in front of us. Thanks to Kristen Ivy Hollison, very thoughtful <laughs> to bring us these masks. I will model it. Very comfortable and stylish. And it matches my outfit. So <laughs> thank you, Kristen. These are very sweet. And we all need a bee pollinator mask in our lives. Excellent. Okay, well, we can um, move forward with closing out the meeting then. Right. So uh, next item is the tough one on the agenda, which is closing an adjournment. And I'd like to thank the board members and, and staff uh, for a good discussion today. And um, with that, I'll entertain um, motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Moved by Commissioner Snowman. Second. Second by Public Member Hintz. Um, all those, I'm not gonna ask for discussion. Because <laughs> if you vote, <laughs> yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Name sign. Hearing no opposition, motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. And please, if you have the ability to stay around, please join us upstairs for some snacks and refreshments and a time to get to know one another. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I mean, not that I would have expected anything.